Popaholics, the show about hot takes other than hot, tasty pancakes, where we're going to be talking about a movie, so don't get out your keyboards and type too furiously. Hope you don't take the guy with the red cape and the magic hammer too seriously. This is Popaholics. Welcome back. It's so good to have you. My name is Christian, and I'm joined, as always, by my two favorite co-hosts. Chris Conkling. And Brian Dupree. And we do things a bit different round here. <laughs> it is. Hey there, Jalila. What's it like in Taika Waititi month? Hey there, Jalila. What's it like in Taika Waititi? It's such a joy to hear you sing it every time, Chris. Yeah, ruin, just ruin it uh, for, for everybody. For those who don't know what's going on, YouTube viewers as well as podcast listeners, uh, this is Bob Alex. We're a bit crazy around here. But around these parts, we've been wacko. Just a little bit. We've been wacko, wacko. And uh, we take every month and theme it this month in honor of the film we're going to be talking about. We're talking about all the films of the great Taika Waititi, someone who I think is increasing in stature moment by moment, and people are so excited <laughs> for me to take over more franchises. So popular. So popular. At Taika uh, Waititi, he's so hot right he now. He went to the Ryan Johnson school of how to piss off nerds. Oh, no. Nerds. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm very excited to talk about uh, today's episode. But we also have our weekly uploads. You should check those out. We do weekly pop culture updates to what's coming out on streaming, in theaters, as well as what we've been consuming. So if you want our thoughts on the news of the week, check those out. But uh, you can always subscribe to us. Hit that bell icon if you're on the YouTube page or subscribe in your favorite podcast player. Link in the show notes. Email us your thoughts about the movie we're going to be talking about at popoholicscast at gmail.com. We'll read them aloud on the weekly upload. You want to get out your thoughts on Thor Love and Thunder? We'd love to share them. Uh, but this is a, a one-way medium right now. And so we're just going to talk about our thoughts. And in the comments and in the emails and whatever you want, you can tell us your thoughts. But without further ado, we've talked about uh, did the Eagle versus Shark, and we've come to something so on the other end of Taika's career. And I'm very excited today. We're talking Thor, Love and Thunder. Kids, get the popcorn now. Let me tell you the story of the space viking, Thor Odinson. He was no ordinary man. He was a god. After saving planet Earth for the 500th time, Thor set off on a new journey. Well, he got in shape. He went from dad bod to god bod. And after all that, Mjolnir. He reclaimed his title as the one and only Thor. Oh, spook too soon. Jane? That is from the trailer of Thor, Love and Thunder. It is directed by the man of the month, Taika Waititi. And can I just say, you know, a lot of these trailers do the redux of old songs. That mm. is an epic retelling, a re composition of it's a great remix Sweet yeah child of mine and just gets you pumped for all the <laughs> amazing guns and roses which has a beautiful nom de plume uh, a beautiful uh, essence uh, what's the word i'm looking for it, it sync synchronizes very well with thor love and thunder love and thunder does. guns and roses right right so good i think the marketing for this film is fantastic and that's the only positive thing Chris has to say about the movie. More. Not true. Not uh, true. Written by Taika Waititi and Jennifer uh, Caton Robinson. Score by Michael Giacchino and <laughs> Axl Rose. I think we should just <laughs> nail me Mulan. Uh, cinematography by Barry Iodine. Iodine? Probably not the name. I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. Not sure. No one's sure. Who could be sure? With a budget of $250 million, as of this record, $148.9 million. I think we can call it ahead of shots and say, hey, it's a certified good ROI. Will it be Marvel ROI? <laughs> Probably not. We'll see. I don't know. It's a fun film. Uh, I, I am genuinely interested to see if this is like something where people who like it go back and see it. Uh, but we'll, t we'll talk more about that as we get into our thoughts. It stars Chris Hemsworth, Christian Bale, Tessa Thompson, Natalie Portman returning to the series, uh, which is very exciting. Ty Taika Waititi as, uh, as Korg, and Russell Crowe also <laughs> makes an appearance in many more. What are we going to talk about? We'll have non-spoiler thoughts, so if you haven't caught the flick yet, we're going to talk about everything non-spoilers, general thoughts about the film. Go right into spoilers, and we're going to talk about 
Uh, probably the tone of this movie is probably going to be the major debate that most people have been having online. So we'll dive a little bit into like, is that working or is it not? And the reasons why some of our favorite standout moments, as well as, uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk about phase six in the MCU briefly and, and how that's going. If we have enough time. phase six or phase four, phase six, we're going to jump ahead of things. I think we should all, try all to, the way to phase six. Yeah, we should skip predict, a phase. We should try to predict. Uh, sorry, I read six films in six. Shows, I'm sorry. So. No, no, you don't be sorry. Uh, I can't read too good. So let's dive into it, gentlemen. Thor: Love and Thunder. Uh, this is the fourth Thor movie. Uh, is this yeah. the first? The only solo film. They're the only solo character to get a fourth watch film. film. Introduced with, uh, I believe, was it Kenneth Branagh who brought? Yeah, us Kenneth Branagh directed the first one. How far we've come! They had some Game of Thrones people do do the second one, and then yeah. Taika's had it since Ragnarok for these two. So let's talk general thoughts about Thor: Love and Thunder. This one's a little bit. Just to preface it, this one's a little divisive, which I am finding exceedingly interesting, and uh, it will be the topic of of a lot of my thoughts. Uh, in in in, and I, I can't wait to share them. But Brian. You've been the most quiet. Chris and I, you got love and you got thunder over there, <laughs> depending on how you're viewing this. Okay. <laughs> and then we've got you in between. Little old, uh, I don't know, Korg. Korg. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't heard your thoughts uh, in, in excruciating detail. So what for were you? Those, for those who aren't watching, I am just a, a face here tonight um, <laughs> without a body. That's a spoiler, um, Brian. I can see some of your body. Hey. <laughs> It's pre spoilers, uh, right? Oh, Trick rules. Me, this isn't me. careful for spoilers. We don't willy nilly just spoil things. James. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, Christian, you had you saw this first of the three of us, and you texted us about how silly it was. Um, I had seen some mixed reactions to it online, a decent amount of negative reactions. So I kind of went in with very, like, not trying to have my hopes set too high. And this movie, I think, starts off really strong. We get immediately our backstory for christian bale as gore the god butcher and i think this sets a tone that the movie definitely strongly deviates from a lot but when we get back there i think that stuff is really working and the thematic elements of what's driving him uh this idea of gods and idols um and how within the context of this universe uh, gods often either just don't care about humanity or are actively spiteful towards humanity mm -hmm. and look down on him. And he kind of has this realization uh, about this relationship with, with gods. And we also see Thor, who even when gods are, quote unquote, on the good side of things, having to grapple with the fact that they're so reckless and destructive at times that they help, but it's kind of backhanded help uh, yeah. as well. Um, which is something that our characters don't fully grapple with throughout the course of this movie, but there is something that is there at least early on. Um, to Very that. early on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Christian Bale is excellent here and is uh, one of my favorite villains in a while. Um, done this way, I think the the way he's visually portrayed and how practical it is is ridiculously effective for me, and I think is is a really strong part of what this movie is doing. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier uh, on on Monday's episode, but it does get a little bit Stranger Things stra slash Kingdom Heartsy at times with our our, our villain. <laughs> like, Whoa! Didn't even make the Kingdom not? Hearts connection. Right. I it's totally there. Though. That is so true, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so it's inspired, um, but I still am having fun with with our villain. Um, I enjoyed the frame story element here. I think the way we kind of have Korg as this narrator is playing into historically not only the fact that comic books are kind of just one-off fun stories and we get that early on these little these little vignettes but also just historically mythology and how it's passed down around the campfire and how <laughs> these thor stories are supposed to be in that same vein of of historic um historical myth mythological storytelling um i thought all of that was working really well and because this movie is kind of all over the place i think the frame story lends itself to the tonal uh shifts that happen throughout it um i think it <sighs> the return of natalie portman 
worked really, really well. And I think this is where the uh, the best emotional beats of the story are happening. Uh, it's a little bit hand wavy how they get her into the main narrative. But with that being said, there's a I'm, I'm dancing around. I don't want to say explicitly how everything plays out, but I think the concept of what drives her to get to where things change for her character, again, ties into this what Thor represents and historically how humanity interacts with gods in really cool ways. I think there's fun stuff happening there, which even in the worst Thor movies, the concepts and and the uh, kind of sci-fi elements are always what is kind of most interesting to me, the, cosm- the cosmology of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Taika once again manages to do something with a hammer that blew my mind and was like, okay, worthwhile <laughs> nearly just to see this new hammer <laughs> hammer element. Um, we get incredible relationship drama between our characters and our hammers, which <laughs> is not what I was expecting, but we'll definitely touch got, on that. Got more this later. guy lurking in the background over here, <laughs> creeping us all out. Yes. And you need is, to calm down. Is that an ice cream shop over there on your other side, Chris? Or, oh gosh, uh, Brian, uh, don't even. <laughs> I think um, I don't think the humor is working as well here as it did in Ragnarok for me. It feels a little forced more so sometimes. And I think it has to do with kind of the tone of where the plot is for most of the movie and what we're jumping back and forth between. But with all the themes, what they're doing, like I said, the gods and the idols stuff, these ideas of grief for for all of our characters and uh, dealing with traumatic experience. And then the movie, it's Taika. It just is bold enough to say, you know what? We're going to do a black and white, se- black and white sequence. It's going to look awesome, and you're just going to go along with it. Um, so I had so much fun with this movie. Um, excited to eventually watch it again, and yeah, uh, I think because I went in with measured, I don't think this is top tier MCU for me. Um, but yeah, definitely a worthwhile watch, and happy to have Taika uh, back at the helm here. I think it's a, a worthy sequel to Ragnarok. It is worthy. I think the sequel can pick up the hammer. Chris, <laughs> agree? I agree with a lot of what Brian said. Uh, I disagree with some of the things that Brian mentioned. Out of the three of us, I have seen the film most recently. Uh, I seen the movie. I saw the movie the same day we're we're recording this. Um, let me start with my positives about the movie. Uh. I, I had a blast watching the movie. So did my wife. Like we were in in everything that the movie was delivering. However, I think there are things that it's not uh, doing particularly well. But in regards to the things that I really like, Brian, I think all three of us are going to mention this. What little we get of Christian Bale in this movie is absolutely phenomenal. I think he's. I think the fact that they were able to give him. Uh, prosthetics to wear and he can really live in this costume enhances his performance in this film and he really leans into the creepier aspects of gore the god butcher and i really like seeing christian bale in this way you know he's such a uh, complex actor and he's been in so many diverse roles and this is just another addition to what he's capable of doing and i really really enjoyed in the movie but I wish we got more of him, to be perfectly honest, in the film. I think there was a lot left on the cutting room floor. Uh, And you're going to find as I talk about the movie, you know, this movie's two hours long. Uh, It's one of the shorter MCU films. But it doesn't even feel like two hours. It feels like an hour and 15. It does. It feels very short. It feels incredibly short. Like when I actually looked up the runtime, I was like, this has to be the shortest MCU film. This has to be the shortest one ever. It is. Yeah. But, but But it's still two hours long. Yeah, it's still two hours long. That being said, though, I think the film could have benefited from maybe like... 10 more 10 to 15 more minutes of Jane Foster and maybe like 10 to 15 more minutes of Gore the God Butcher. I think that would have done wonders to both of their narratives, to be perfectly honest. Um, more positives. I absolutely love the color palette of this film. Like the the highs and the the 1980s vibes that we're getting on Asgard and in Thor's costume or like it's it's awesome to see that and then compare that to what brian was talking about when all the color is removed at some point in the film it's just uh very beautiful to have these two things 
juxtaposed next to one another. When that moment happens, the way the color grading shifts is is very cool. And uh, I, I think Tycho's bringing something very interesting to the MCU that we haven't seen before in regards to the color palette of the film. Dig Which it. Which historically really has been absolutely muted. Gray. A gray and without <laughs> any life whatsoever. So yes. I, I can't... Uh, outside of a few exceptions, like, you know, the Guardians of the Galaxy films and Taika's first MCU film, Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, sure. Uh, most of it is all th the same. Yeah. So I think um, I can't so, be understated enough that this movie is dripping with style. And I love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. Um, Christian, you, you mentioned this, this similarly, or you mentioned the same thing in our, our group chat, but uh, Chris Hemsworth is always going to be great as Thor. Whatever movie he's in, uh, he's a, an amazing Thor and a, a crazy male specimen. Spiderhead. So great Thor. Uh, <laughs> great, yeah, great Thor and Spiderhead. Now, in any... Whenever he's portraying the character of Thor, he's always incredibly charming. He always looks like he's having a lot of fun being Thor, and I really appreciate that. And this film is no exception. Um, and then, like I said, he's just... Jacked. Dude is jacked. I'm so jealous. Great ass, too. You know what I mean? <laughs> he, he really does. He really does. I was telling my wife earlier today that I'm incredibly comfortable in my sexuality, comfortable enough to say that I am... In very jealous of the physical shape that Chris Hemsworth is in. He's a very attractive man. Um, yeah. To continue with pros, I really appreciate how Jane Foster and Gore are foils to each other in this film. I'm not going to go into specifics, but they're both both experiencing similar things. Uh, and, and I really like the way Taika's kind of handling both of those journeys and ju juxtaposing them off of one another. Okay. Things that I don't particularly like about Thor Love and Thunder. And Christian already mentioned some of them. Brian kind of mentioned some of them. This has been at the forefront of the discussion since the movie's come out. But this movie is so incredibly tonally inconsistent. And Brian mentioned how, like, the 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 front half of the movie is kind of really working for him. And I, I do agree. Like the first, I would say probably 20 minutes, maybe even less, maybe like first 10 or 15 minutes of the movie. I'm fully on board because at that point, the movie is all comedy. Like it's only presented itself to be like this very goofy, fun superhero romp. Right. Well, we do get the, the gore stuff right off the bat. Right at the beginning. The fanfare. That's true. That's true. So, yeah, it's true. Uh, it's yeah. cold, cold open. It, it is a cold open. Yeah. But as soon as we we hit our, our main characters, um, yeah. fully on board until, and I can't, we'll talk about this more in spoilers, but until we hit a point where Mickey and I both looked at each other and we were like, uh, this just seems kind of tonally disrespectful to what's happening right now. Like, I don't think... We eventually get to a point where this particular element of the narrative is starting to to make me uh, tear up and resonate with me, and it feels like they're being a little more respectful about it. But I don't think that the first couple of times that it's mentioned, it's handled properly. And I think because of the whiplash we're getting in terms of the tone from comedy to what's supposed to be a more serious topic, it just doesn't land well with me. Um, also, the performance from the character or the performance from the actor in those moments, I'm not really on board for it. I, I, I also think that she is kind of taking it too lightly as well. And I know that that's probably... Sorry, the, who, the, who, what character are you talking about, Chris? Jane Foster. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I know that her performance is probably coming down to direction, so I don't want to say that it's entirely Natalie Portman's fault. It probably has a lot to do with direction, script, and how Taika likes to handle script with a lot of improvisation. And I just don't think it works very well for the subject matter that we are talking about in the film. Uh, it just doesn't work for me. And that being said, this is where you and I kind of disagree, Brian, where like, I don't really like the framing device of Korg's narration because we start in one place where he's telling a story about Thor and we end in another place where he's telling a story about Thor that's supposed to be more emotionally resonant based on what's happened in the plot. And I just don't get there. 
Like I, based on what happens in the film, it just does not work for me. But you have other films that try to attempt to do the same thing, like Into the Spider Verse, that has similar narration. You know, with the comic books. Hey, let's do this one more time. You know, every time they introduce a new Spider-Man, there's a little bit of voiceover. That works really well. But uh, the the Quark stuff is just too. It's too goofy for me. I, I think it's um, totally out of touch with. I think. I, sorry. No, no, please. I think your point about Portman and the way it's handled early on without we'll, we'll get into spoilers later, but I could see how it is definitely can be read as insensitive um, for sure. And, and not maybe dealing with the full severity of, of the reality of, of the situation. I think that's definitely fair, uh, a fair criticism there. Um, and yeah, it's the silliness of the movie is just at the forefront when yeah. Um, I want to say, I think the emotional stuff is the weakest uh, element of this movie for me as well. I really didn't, wasn't swept up in the the big climax of this movie. I, I liked it more thematically than I did in, in practice and in that regard. Um, so I, I'm kind of on the same boat with you there in terms of it not really getting me there uh, emotionally. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say in, in regards to, you know, kind of my, my cons for the film is uh, I've never disliked anything that Taika Waititi's made. Everything that I've seen from him has always been excellent in my opinion. And I hold the man still, even after seeing Thor Love and Thunder uh, in very high regard. I think he's a creative genius and he's, he's a master at his craft. But I think the way in which he handles his scripts and it's something that I appreciate about all of his original material is he likes to improvise with his actors. And I think that brings out a lot of fun and creative and unique moments in a lot of his original work. I think with this particular film, he should have held back a little bit. You know, in Thor Ragnarok, it was his first time entering into this like big blockbuster studio type of movie. And I think because of that, he tempered himself for Thor Ragnarok. So you had this perfect balance of improvised comedy and what what he had to do to kind of please Marvel Studios. And what we've been seeing a lot in phase four of the MCU, and you know, we just talked about the multiverse of madness, and at least in the multiverse of madness, I really dug it, was directors being kind of let off the reins a little bit more than we've seen in the past phases. And while in the Multiverse of Madness, I think letting Sam Raimi do his thing brought a lot of really awesome things to that film. While I love Taika, I think letting him do his thing in this movie, all the impro- all the improvisation was a detriment to the movie. I think what, what ends up happening is we watch a two-hour movie where it feels as though the script is very unstable. There are moments where our characters also feel like they're improvising their plans within the film to the point where none of them really have a clear sense of what they need to do or what they're going to do or how things are unfolding. It all seems way too improvised in my opinion. And uh, I think he really could have tightened things up a little bit and delivered a, a more stable narrative overall, especially considering all the things that this movie is trying to do. You know, I think there are a lot of fantastic concepts and I'm speaking in very broad terms because we're non-spoilers, but I think there are a lot of fantastic and interesting concepts in this movie uh, and some that could really hit home with a lot of people, really resonate with people. But uh, I just don't think it works because of his style of filmmaking. So this is the first time that Taika has kind of uh, disappointed me. But to be perfectly honest, I. I don't really view Thor Love and Thunder as a Taika Waititi film. I think it's still Taika shackled by, you know, big blockbuster studio, Disney. So take take that how you will, I suppose. Anyway, I've rambled long enough about the movie. Christian, uh, how do you feel about Thor Love and Thunder? Um, I'll start with cons. I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a great, great movie. I, I think it's, so much fun and for me just like multiverse a breath of fresh air in the mcu this is the first to me successful just really goofball comedy that that they've had in the mcu and what 
makes me sad about some of the reaction is that if you look at, and, and this is a much better film, to be clear, but everything, everywhere, all at once. Mm -hmm. It's totally all over the place. It is goofy. It is serious. It has action. But it's all over the place. And, and although, again, admitting it's a more well-crafted film, it's not shackled to anything. So we see it, and it is... But, and, and I would have to do research on this, how much of that movie is improvised? I don't know. And I, I think the end product in your experience through it is, is what's more important than the level of improvisation. Because let's be clear with this MC movie, there's only so much you can improvise uh, because of the amount of visual effects that go into and you know pre-making it and, and working through that. This movie is made completely different than that movie. But just from a... Just from a essence of what something can be and the uniqueness of it and i think what upsets me about the reaction what scares me is that we find like if you look at ant-man and the wasp which is my always like go to like it tried to be a comedy but it also it, it didn't have the balls to be like to like break any rules so it just ended up being like boring and bland and like and the mcu always does fun comedy throughout even its most serious pictures endgame has a lot of comedy in it but it's sparse, sprinkled, relieves tension. And that's how you do a... That, that is kind of the formula for a lot of these action blockbuster movies, like regardless right. of superhero genre or whatever. But to be a straight-out comedy, you have to be risky, you have to take chances, and you have to be balls-to-the-wall silly. And this movie does it while I think being moderately successful at also having a drama. And to me, the more I've actually ruminated, watching it, it really did feel like you would shift into reverse after going 120 and fifth. And and there was this jarring feeling. But the more I think about it, the more cohesively it actually resonates with me more because uh, Gore the God Butcher is a very dark tale. But what's funny is you say, oh, that opening sequence, I've heard this said multiple times, the opening sequence does not match the rest of the film and it, in, 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 in it set a tone that it didn't have. But that whole opening sequence... Um, kind of like it goes into a very jokey place and it's a very right. serious desperate person being faced with someone who doesn't give a shit and is just right. joking around and the movie kind of grapples with that and the more i've ruminated on the more i've actually respected kind of some of the overall themes of it and how they're accomplished in the fact that um there are very 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 serious subjects you have you have a, a plot involving uh, children's lives at stake, right? But then you also have this uh, absolute uh, ignorance from very, very powerful beings. And and oftentimes, like, especially now, this movie, movie really hit me hard because overall the movie, like, when we think about living in the world we live in, we are at the whims of things we do not have any control over. And it's kind of our humor and silliness that gets us through it. And I do see a parallel between those things bumping up against each other. And this film, at its core, for a PG-13 Marvel movie, is Marvel's first dark comedy. I do believe it can be classified in firmly in a dark comedy. Hmm, because it's so okay. irreverent with how very dark some of its themes are. Um, and it's, it's uh, seemingly indifferent to the loss of life. However, while having a goofball cosmic adventure. And I think that's bold and that's cool. And I think about even successful films that have taken this approach in the comic, in like superhero genres. It's like Deadpool. Can Deadpool exist in the MCU? And a lot of people have argued like, oh, it'll be really challenging. And you know why? Is because now there's all this other baggage to it. And I do think it's like the downside of how people view their expectations for what the MCU is going to be and what these movies have to offer because this feel this in Doctor Strange in a lot of ways feel really fresh to me and I'm very excited about these movies that have come out and I'm hearing so much backlash to people being like well this is just too different and, and again I'm not going to say it's for better or for worse and the movies are of themselves like their own thing but like I want this and I'm it, it, it like really bums me out that people Do are you? mad about anything that is different and I'm not saying it's better but I'm saying Take these swings because this standalone, unshackled for the MCU, just as a single movie, is a real, really interesting dark comedy in this genre. And we just haven't had that since Deadpool. And to me, a lot of stuff is working better than even in Deadpool. Uh, but, but Chris, you were going to say. I was just going to ask, uh, do you mind if I interrupt you to ask you a question about that? Well, because you interrupted me with a question, <laughs> so I think it's okay. Perfect. So, uh, 
I, I really like where you're coming from. And I think you are right that it prevent it. The movie presents some very dark themes. My question for you is, do you think that it explores and presents those themes effectively? Because I, I think that the film, and, and this is something like, I feel like a broken record. Cause I, I feel like I've said similar things about Kenobi recently. And, and like all these things, like all these productions are presenting really interesting concepts and yet they're not effectively delivering on any of these promises like they're they're not exploring them to the degree in which they should like do you feel we get enough gore the god butcher in this movie to explore that dark comedy and to truly explore his disdain for gods you know i i don't know about the disdain for gods but the dark comedy bit there's a bit where he's talking to a group of children. Yes. And I think he's trying to, <laughs> and it's undeniably yeah. hilarious. It's great. It's great. <laughs> but I, 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 cause I personally don't think, I, I think that I agree with you and that it presents the idea, but I don't think it effectively explores it enough to even say that it's, it's a, a core theme of the film. Well, and this is, so this is kind of, it gives like, up on it basically is what I'm saying. But, and I, and you know, we can throw blame at anything as critics, but, when you're like, would you like 15 minutes more of Gore the God Butcher? I'm like, yeah, Christian Bale's amazing. Probably, <laughs> yeah. Right? I, I'm not against that. And, and I do think I'd probably enjoy the film more. But the fact that it's not there doesn't take away the overall ideas working for me. And I think I disagree fundamentally about why, like, I don't know. We'll talk about it in spoilers. But there was a, a, a level of like, well, he's not Thor the God Butcher unless he's butchering gods. And, you know, that's not really what I need to see from that character personally to make it work more. I, I think this is a constant problem in a, a lot of these movies it, 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 where you say like they bring up a lot of themes and there's a lot of stuff. Could they have dived deeper? Yes. Like, sure. But again, there's no movie in the MCU that is like this movie. And for that... I'll I was you. surprised and having such a good time and I was bawling laughing like the entire time and I just had fun while at the same time being terrified. There's some really horrific like scary fucking moments in this and like like to me that was like the ride and it, it gave me a jolt of comedy and suspense that like sometimes I don't feel in these movies and I like that they took the swing. I don't think everything's working. I, I couldn't defend that, but like I will take this over half of the MCU. Just like I said with multiverse, like I will take this over half the MCU and like, I don't care that it has very little to do with the rest of the MCU. There's some stuff and it's fun for fans and stuff, but like to me, like the things that are shackling it are the things that shackle all MCU movies, but at least this one has the balls to have just like absurdist gags like that's fun that that can exist in this movie and and frankly it just like gets me it really like again i don't think you have to agree that this movie's like i, I that you like it as much as i do um but you know the things that people are complaining i'm like well these are just problems with these movies and i could point to literally every problem like do you think in thor the dark world we got enough character development from the dark elf uh no you know no that name? movie's <laughs> terrible <laughs> and like when I look at the Thor movies, it's like, what's the best movie compared to this? Ragnarok, right? And most people do like Ragnarok. And I will admit, like, I like that movie too. I personally like this more because I feel like it leans more into the dark humor. And I think uh, Thor the God Butcher is more interesting. Thor the God Butcher. Uh, yeah, sorry, their names rhyme. There's so many names that sound exactly the same. Yeah, I can't wait till we get Bor, the uh, the uh, MCU sameness god, <laughs> who decides that uh, this movie will just be a retelling of Iron Man 1. Uh, but with Thor skin. Uh, Thor, 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 I skin. believe. <laughs> oh, Not oh, to get uh, nerdy for a moment, but I believe that Bor is actually the name of Thor's grandfather. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, you know that. Odin's father. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've said a lot that's more like in the defense of the existence than like general overall thoughts. But uh, I, I think before we get to spoilers, I'll just sum summarize with... Uh, I just had so much fun. I want these movies to be fun. It was fun in a unique way. It surprised me. There's some gags that don't work and kind of take me out of it, sure. Um, but I think the more I've sat on it, the more the tonal stuff makes it more of that dark comedy that I was referring to that uh, give it a unique place, I think. And and I want to be clear. Like, I, I agree with you. Like, I would like more unique films in the MCU. I just, I kind of want my cake and I want to eat it too in that, I want to see uniqueness and I also want them to be narratively and thematically strong. You know, like why can't we have both? Why can't something be 
visually interesting, but also uh, have a, a strong narrative to it. And that's kind of what we've seen with both. Yeah. I with just both think the multiverse of madness and Thor love and thunder is I that they're think... both visually interesting, but their scripts aren't the strongest. But the, 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 Maybe that has to do with COVID. Maybe that has to do with the pandemic and when they're being shot, but uh, Obadiah Stane, where does he, okay. Like people will rank Iron Man one top five, top 10 MCU. And it's a great movie. I love it. Obadiah Stane is a very underdeveloped out of nowhere, bad guy, silly character. And he sucks as a character. What is the theme of Iron Man? The theme of Iron Man is that like, Oh, my dad made weapons and now I'm better. Like the themes of that movie are fucking not that strong, but it's fun and it's consistent and it's got cool special effects. But overall, it's kind of an okay movie. This movie is the same, but it's more funny and it's more creative. And like, and, and I don't think it's as consistent as Iron Man one. I'm not saying that, but like the things that people are complaining about, I'm like, you're just complaining about MCU movies. Like this at least has the balls to have a fucking ax that's like, <laughs> like uh, has like life to it, and like we're really gonna commit to that gag. And God damn it, goats. We'll are talk about that. And screaming throughout this entire thing, and it's <laughs> whack a doozy, and it takes fucking. It has a whole sequence in black and white, and like visually, it's trying cool things. Like I'm sorry, but like every, I love all that stuff. I know, but like, and again, the things I've heard people actually complain about. I like actually actively upset me because I'm like, I just don't, I don't have the mental connection that you can't draw these same criticisms to every, like people going, there wasn't enough Thor the guy. I don't think it was well developed. Okay. D Dark Elf, Obadiah Stane. Uh, give me some more. Uh, Whiplash. Uh, <laughs> every, like literally every you single. You can't, you can't say every I know single you're getting, MCU villain except I know for you're Thanos. getting upset. I know I'm you're getting upset, upset but upset. you can't use, you can't use Malekith as an example. Everyone agrees that that is the worst, M one of the worst MCU movies, and that he is underdeveloped, and that's one of the things that makes it a terrible MCU movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, when people are like, "Man, I just couldn't," I, I, you know what? I give ten out of tens to all the MCU movies, but this one is just low. And it's like, okay, name your name villains that were fully developed. It's like, all right, Thanos. Um, no, you Killmonger. have like Kill Loki, Killmonger, who has multiple films. Three. There's 30 fucking films. You have three good villains. And you actually have one that is probably top five villain who you just want a little more of. And I'm like, I, I don't know. To, to me, it's like the balance of how people feel about things. But and you're not coming across this way. And we'll get into spoilers. But it's like, like, oh, uh, the doors. Like, he's not a character anymore. And uh, I, just, I just fuck off with that. I, I don't know. It's like, I feel weird. I think for Thor is still a character. I, I, I really yeah, like what Tyke is doing that. with him. You're not saying that. In this movie, I think... Having Thor go through a midlife crisis, especially considering that he's a being that's over 1,500 years old, is very interesting, especially with everything that we've already gotten with that character in the MCU. So, I don't know. We, we can talk about it more in spoilers. But yeah. uh, Brian, did you have anything? It looked like you had something you wanted to say. Oh, no. I don't, I don't, okay. I don't no. think there's anything specifically right now. I like movies. <laughs> Just right. not Spider-Man No Way Home. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd agree. I'm never going to let it go, Brian. I'm sorry. And again, like <laughs> Spider-Man No Way Home. A and the a way I feel, the way I rant that, about this movie is similar to the way you rant about Spider-Man No Way and again, Home. So, Sp I mean, Spider-Man No Way Home, a movie that like I had fun watching, but like is cheap. It's not that good of a movie. People would be like, oh, yeah, that's a way better like constructed movie. It's like, no, the movie's fucking not really. a mess. <laughs> like, I much rather, like, I like both existing. I'm not going to pit them against each other. But within the confines of the MCU, I'm glad Thor Love and Thunder exist. I had a blast. Uh, let's jump into more stuff in spoilers starting now. <laughs> So I think we adequately, without spoiling anything, covered like tone and stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. we we do need to talk about some moments that stand out. But let, let's start. You know, we're we're on that we're on that like criticism train right now. So why don't we start out with uh, maybe a couple moments that aren't working as well, and then we'll kind of like build it up better and and positively with uh, standout moments. Um, Chris, okay. uh, I'll I'll just you know kind of expand on on what I was talking about in non spoilers with Jane Foster's cancer storyline. You know. We get there. By by the end of the film, I was weeping. But I think the scene at the beginning with her at the clinic, with Darcy, uh, and, and I makes, get it. Uh, how many stages are there, Joe? Yeah, it just it just seems yeah. um, out of touch in terms of like what people go through when they have cancer. It's it's not. 
I think this is one of the most tonally egregious things the movie's doing. I can, I can, I can deal can with, I, you know, I everything that's with, with maybe, sure, maybe sure. A, a counterpoint, which is that, um, and it's like, it's almost like a, like a Soviet era level way, but I feel like America in general and the world is unfortunately going towards this place. And maybe something I like with is just Natalie Portman's entire arc as the mighty Thor. And, and even in that stage four joke thing, it's like I'm asking for the blessing of another power and hopefully, please, anything save me from this that is outside of what my control is. And the only way she's able to get through all this trauma is fucking jokes. And as someone who's a pretty jokey but also depressed guy, I connect with that. And there's part of her story that I actually, thinking more about it, I'm like, oh, it's actually kind of brilliant that there is this facade of her like, oh, I'm going to play superhero. And this th this thing, the hu the hammer represents fucking magic of storytelling and socialization and making jokes and making light of a shitty situation. And that's what pulls her through until where she ultimately it, it meets her end. And that emotionally for me works even as totally inconsistent because life is a, like right now we're on this podcast and there are things that we are infuriated about the way the world is going and how do we get through it we make dumb dick jokes on a podcast oh yeah yeah and, you know i i use humor as a as a coping mechanism as well like i i fully understand that they're they're just i guess my problem with it is twofold in that i can agree with you that I, I think Jane Foster could be using humor as a coping mechanism. But in a lot of those scenes, I kind of feel like Taika was having Natalie Portman improvise those scenes. Like I think in those scenes at least, the script should have been airtight and she should have been reading lines from the script. Like to I mean, me, you, you can know, improvise. You don't know you can improvise. the script. <laughs> I don't, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't. I just, I'm, I'm assuming here and Obviously, that's a dangerous thing to do, but like they just I don't know. They don't feel terribly well written to me, to be perfectly honest. And that's what leads me to believe they may have been improvised on the spot. And there are this is a nitpick and there are visual elements to this. But like, why does she? Why didn't they give Natalie Portman like a bald cap? Like she's going through chemo. She should have less hair. That would also be a more impactful transformation when she becomes mighty Thor and she has these like incredibly beautiful blonde locks, you know, like in the comics, when Jane it first transforms into Thor, she's been going through chemo for a long time and she has already lost all of her hair. So that juxtaposition is apparent in the comic books and it's more impactful in the comic books. But like Natalie Portman still kind of seems like a healthy individual at the beginning of this film. And it, relatively, I think you know I she think, is a little I, skinnier. If I'm not mistaken, but, it's established that she just found out that she has stage four cancer, so you don't lose your I, hair. I don't and, remember that being established, but yeah, I don't think she it could be head she cannon had, for a while. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I honestly, I don't know, but I'm like, I think that it wasn't like, oh, you've had cancer for five years, like right. If you no, yeah, just start was, chemo, you... I think I remember that, too. Yeah, yeah I don't... When you just start... Recent. You lose your hair gradually over the course of time. Yeah. But but I think, aesthetically, you make a good point about, you know, maybe that's more impactful, her going from... Uh, they could have made it more visually striking, is what sure. I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. She has sunken eyes. She's pale. Yeah. And know, as the film just... goes on, she gets progressively more sickly yeah. whenever she transforms back into Jane Foster, and I do appreciate that. And like I said, by the time... She's in the hospital bed and Thor's going off to fight Gore for the final time. Like that stuff's hitting me. Yeah. You know, it, it is resonating with me emotionally. Yeah. But um, I think some things could have been changed. And Brian, that's just my own personal opinion. Any nitpicks that you want to point out? I honestly, I don't know. I don't really go looking for for these things generally. Um, the shining light of the Papaholics, <laughs> Brian Dupree. No, I just. Uh, ultimately, I think the, uh, the ending is a little, feels maybe a little bit cheap, even though like, like you were saying earlier, Chris, like the themes are there, but I don't think it's as effectively done as it could be, uh, with what they're going for. Um, feels a little bit like, um, 
the hand waviness of the end of Interstellar, which is something I brought up in our conversation. It's earlier. just love. And similarly, love. love. It's just, <laughs> yeah. it's just love. That's how she's love. It Literally, it's hard um, to pull that off and it feel genuine for sure. Yeah, especially for um, cynical. I think the movie actually like can be but, at times, but yes. For, with powerful. that being said, the payoff of Love and Thunder, the the title coming around, great. It's great. It great. It got me. It was yeah. I, it's I really also liked that. Even so. more great knowing that that uh, the young girl is uh, Chris Hemsworth's daughter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. All actually wow. uh, on this point, all That's the children sweet. are all the cast and crews. Uh, ch- yeah, like, you have uh, in really? in the group of as guardians, you have Tyka's kid, you have Natalie Portman's daughter. Uh, like Christian said, a lot of cast and crew. And the apparently, kids. they did the concept art for all the dark, scary monsters, which I thought was like a brilliant move. Of, Very cool. Uh, what like, scares you? You what know, scares children, and um, that's genius. Yeah, and I think they're like. You know, they kind of are like the heartless, but I really actually thought they were, I mean, they're nondescript black CG scary monsters, but there was, I think, more character to them than in a lot of like, you know, whatever fucking CGI hell dogs. Like there was a, a very spooky element to to all of them um, that I thought was pretty cool. Was that a, was that a Stranger Things jab? <laughs> Uh, with the Heartless? No, it's a uh, Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> the Hell Dogs. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't know if that was. A... No, I'm trying to think I, of, okay. of like uh, in uh, in Infinity War. Like it's just these ugly. Okay. Okay. Things. That yeah. Just... The uh, the Outriders are what they're called within. Of within course, the you know what they're called. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. While Christ. we're talking about the scary <laughs> hell, the, the scary Hell Dogs and Heartless in Thor: Love and Thunder. Um, I will say this, and I think this is something that a lot of fanboys will get bent out of shape about, uh, and I doubt that you guys know this, but the Necro Sword in the comic books actually stems from Null, who is like the king of the symbiotes. So the the Necro Sword is actually part of Venom, and all of these monsters in the comics. Wait, are, are you saying we're gonna need a symbiotes. fucking Venom tie-in? Sony. Yeah. Now that's I'm what, interested. That's what all these crazy fanboys were hoping for. But I actually really like, and I, and I typically like the way the MCU adapts things from the comic books, and it's not always beholden to the source material. I like the fact that they were able to do similar things with the Necro Sword and with Gore without specifically having to say, you know, th- these are symbiotes, you know? Like, I, I dig that. And yes, part of that is like legal, legal issues, but um, I think they were able to, able to accomplish the same thing without actually having to say it okay so you're telling me the shadow creatures are symbiotes in this movie but they just don't call them that in the co- they're not in the movie no in the movie okay. they're I'm like, saying in the in the source material in the source material okay. in the source material but they're symbiotes which i like okay. i like that the mcu has stopped doing this which is like because in the first thor it's very clear that this is technology right <laughs> Like they're like the magic hammer makes sense in think, science. Well, I think the, Natalie Portman her, even refers to it as like mystical uh, Viking magic in this movie or something. Yeah, yeah. They've completely <laughs> instead of science for the better because of how ridiculous it's getting. So I believe the Necrosword is is fully dark realm. You yeah, know. completely supernatural. Yeah. They're not even trying. Which don't <laughs> like. I don't think it works. Ryan, in- you were saying no it, it explained it as much as it needed to be explained within the within the movie and it's like okay i understand the function yeah and like you said chris you you brought up well the tie-in with the uh with mjolnir and natalie portman the thing that is they're uh, they're using it but it's also destroying them um that, that i love that good, between the two the necro out. sword yeah. is killing is killing gore the entire movie and mjolnir is essentially killing jane um yeah it's great i don't know any specific nitpicks i mean i think i would i would lightly agree with some of the stuff that's upset you chris is that uh, i i definitely could use more like i love christian bale in this movie he is one of the most interesting i think if you're comparing Lo- like loki has had a whole fucking series and he was the bad guy in the crossover avengers movie. like Look, he's been in quite a bit of stuff. Gore is in this movie for like eight minutes, you know. So I would say for an eight-minute villain, God, that blows my mind. Uh, pretty for a two-hour movie. I don't know how long it's been. he's in it for. Like probably fifteen yeah. minutes, ten, fifteen minutes total. Um, he's excellent. He's amazing. Of course, I could use more of him. Yes, I think that I think they might have been worried on the cutting room floor, and maybe it was from like testing audiences that it was like 
the tonal stuff was stretching it by having more of like uh, Gore, uh, Gore the God Butcher stuff. But yeah, I could have done with more Christian Bale because he's just that good. But what it means is every scene he's in is very is is a hundred percent effective. Agreed. And he's definitely like top five MCU villains, especially for a one shot villain. He, he's so good. Um, so I I really appreciated it. I, I think from the makeup to how he's doing it, that scene with the kids is just so goddamn good because I think that's the blending of the, this is a fucked yeah. up situation. He's a very serious villain in a very goofy movie. And I think that scene is very pivotal, pivotal to the bridge of all the tones of the movie where you're like, you're laughing, but you're also creeped out, like pulling out the monster and being like, he loves having his head ripped. He, off. Oh yeah. He's like, yeah. you guys, then he rips it off. He, he liked it a moment about ago. Ripping off heads. Huh? <laughs> and he goes in full bail cockney. Uh, it's very good. It's very good. So let's let's talk about some standout moments of of, of what we liked. Uh, Brian, let's start with you. What, what are some things that stand out that you like? I feel like most of my standout moments are kind of like bits. Um, yeah, like it's, that's what eighty percent of this movie yeah, is, Brian. It's, it's so that's acceptable. Bits. So the <laughs> what about goats? Early... Is there goats? Is a joke that is funny. And then it's not funny. And then it's the funniest. Comes back around. <laughs> yes. I, I will say while we're on the topic of the goats, um, I could have I could have done with one less goat joke. And that is when the ship crashes into the asteroid and the goats are like, <laughs> I was like, okay, that is one goat joke too many. Like I was laughing for all the other ones. Mm -hmm. That one is just absurd. And then it like, happens. It, this is what I'm talking about. And then it happens later, and then you laugh again. <laughs> That's when does it happen after that? The goats, the goats. I, I think the goats laugh towards the end of the movie. Like, oh yeah, when they take the ship back or something. The it is are... hilarious when Korg it's, it's is like great. when they first get the goats, and they're like Thor is absolutely taken with like the majesty of the goats, and Korg's just like they do yell a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing them destroy the Guardian ship is hilarious and having the Guardians interact with them. I honestly wish the Guardians were in the movie a little bit more, um, yeah. but uh, I think they served their purpose well, at least. Yeah, we could Seeing do. Nebula try to kill the goats, hilarious. <laughs> Brian, stand up bit. <laughs> yeah, so this is from that. Sorry that to take that early away from on. Brian. No, that's okay. That's okay. This is good. Um, there's a fight scene early on, which is completely ridiculous. And we see Thor do the Jean Claude Van Damme <laughs> like, splitsies, one eighty split with these guys, and holds it for so long. Holds it. Like, we get an anime level of like face off, like like. Yes. And the the creatures that he's battling look like they're straight out of like Labyrinth or something. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're so weird it's looking. Fun. It's yeah. very interesting. Him shouting at like the the beast as like he's maintaining the split. It's all good stuff. It's all really working for me. And that announcement, uh, first of all, he's up like meditating. And this is what I, so this is ultimately where I go against some of the fanboys about like where Thor's at. Cause they're like, oh, they did Thor dirty. Like they don't take like Thor's just a big dumb, dumb. And I'm like, Chris Hemsworth and Tycho wrote this movie to get like what helps shape who this character was. And like, again, I, this goes to the level of this character has been through so much goddamn trauma. Mm -hmm. Like out of all of our characters, Thor has lost the most. And Korg does reiterate at the beginning uh -huh. all the loss that he's got. Oh my god, through. when they go through the montage, it's so good. <laughs> like all of his friends and family dying. Um, and it's like he's in a false sense of enlightenment, but he, he really has not gotten over all the shit that has followed in his wake. But he is kind of like not taking himself seriously because I think if he thinks about it for too long, he will just like be depressed and sad. Just and break. He's really trying to zen himself out. And the fact that he jumps on, like, I, I knew I was in. Riding Stormbreaker like a fucking witch. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. But, I, I, it's so funny. It's just too funny because it's weird. The small visual flourish, which uh, I have to think is a genius move by Taika to make the, all what has to be, like, years of pre work really well, is he's up and he's giving a speech. And even, uh, even one of the moments with the Guardians that we get where... Um, star lord is literally like quoting what he's saying because he's like oh i love this part because <laughs> secretly he's like in love with thor and what he represents uh 
he's going through and talking about it and he's got his cloak and the laser goes through his cloak and fries it as he's turning Mickey around. and I both laughed out loud at that moment. Uh, it's such a good little visual thing that really connects us to all the bu- like crazy CG bullshit that's happening. And I, it's just a small moment, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, and then to go into fucking guns and roses, uh, welcome to the jungle. Um, it, I don't know. I'm amped. It, it gave me that beginning of Thor Ragnarok when we get Led Zeppelin of, yeah, it's all very silly and, I think plays to how he's a God with a magic hammer who basically can't die. So nothing is very inherently interesting about his struggles outside of how ridiculously cool you can make this all look and how silly. So I think, I think it works. Uh, But yeah, you get the John glad John Claude Van Damme split kick thing. So good. Christian. I'm so glad you brought the broomstick was my, that that was on my list as well. That's the point I'm like, I love this movie. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm looking see for. See you down there. <laughs> and it's like, and then you see him fly off in the background, well, which is what's so good. Fantastic. Is he's yeah. a real, he literally jumps off set <laughs> with, it, with it between his legs. Like you see him fully fall out of frame. Like he's going onto a pad or something like the fact that he just drops like a brick out of frame and then is in the background flying. Like, you know, those are the little things that actually connect me uh, to a lot of these movie special effects, which which arguably, I'm going to be very honest, the special effects in this movie are eh. Like, the ideas are cool, yeah. and there's some sequences that are good, but the overall special effects uh, suck as much as all the other Marvel movies suck, uh, yeah. besides the very big event films where they're like, we spent, I, we actually spent some time <laughs> on the scene. Right. Like, this yeah, feels yeah. like... Thanos has hair that you're never going to be able to see unless you because zoom in on it. We paid these guys more money. <laughs> Uh, that do all this visual effects work to do a good job. Imagine that. Uh, Chris, any, any other standout moments? We <laughs> talked about it a little bit earlier in our non-spoiler section, but making Stormbreaker and Mjolnir sentient. <laughs> yep. Has well, com- to be totally- fair, Mjolnir, I don't think is sentient. Stormbreaker, Stormbreaker is. Stormbreaker definitely is. And, and actually, well, to be fair, he's kind of part Groot. So it kind of makes sense that, that there is, true. is more sentience in Stormbreaker than there is in Mjolnir. But I will say we, we know that Mjolnir at least can hear and understand Thor because he, that's the reason why it ultimately allows um, Natalie Portman's character. I don't, I don't know Thor, if it's right? as much. He I don't know if it's as magic, much him uh, hearing party. him or just Thor casting an enchantment. Okay. Fair. You know, because like Odin whispers to Mjolnir to cast the the enchantment uh, That's right. onto the hammer to to make whoever can pick up Mjolnir, wh- whoever be worthy, will have the power of Thor. You know, all that jazz. So uh, I, I'll, I'll go with you on that ride, Brian, because it makes it funnier that both of them are sentient. But it could also just be like Thor imbuing the hammer unintentionally with extra magic. But Stormbreaker is definitely sentient because there are multiple times throughout the movie where it struggles to to summon the Bifrost because it is jealous of Thor's relationship with Mjolnir. Yes. (laughs) And it's just the way (laughs) when Thor's trying to summon Mjolnir in uh, kind of the courthouse in New Asgard, and Stormbreaker just kind of slides from around the corner <laughs> from out of frame. And Thor's like, it's an oh, absolutely uh, perfect. Game. I, 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 I was just coming to get you. I was just going, <laughs> coming to find you. <laughs> it's so awkward, but I, I absolutely love it. Well, and I think it works meta contextually as far as like Thor, we know him as the person, the hammer, the hammer's back in the game. Thor kind of wants his hammer, like at Stormbreaker's cool and all, but like Thor is Thor and the hammer. And I think that plays yeah. really well to our understanding of what we like from Thor and you reintroduce it. Uh, I will say this about the sentience of the last thing I want to say about the sentience of Stormbreaker and where the movie ends. And this is very nerdy and very stupid. And this is pro- just a me problem. I doubt anybody else has this problem. I was a little upset that Thor ended up with Mjolnir and, and love ended up with Stormbreaker at the end of the movie. I think I would have preferred that, that Thor reconcile his relationship with Stormbreaker. We knew Stormbreaker was pass a on He pass on Mjolnir from, you know, his the love of his life that's passed away to his new surrogate daughter. You know, I think that as stupid as what I'm saying is, <laughs> I think uh, script wise, that would have made more sense. 
Or, I, that's what I would have done, I at least. Know. Let's think It doesn't it. matter in the long run. No, but let's but... really dive into this. <laughs> Stormbreaker was always a means to an end, okay? Stormbreaker oh literally... Thor and the hammer literally broke up, okay? They're, they're done. But Mjolnir kept a promise. And even though he fell in love with a woman, Mjolnir took care of that woman until her dying breath, right? And, and kept her alive and kept her safe. And Stormbreaker always knew this thing was temporary, okay? Stormbreaker comes from a piece of another, another, another family. And it's only right that Stormbreaker finds someone who's really going to appreciate uh, her, her. <laughs> Uh, such as a, a 12 year old girl so I, think- I cannot wait to see the Disney Plus series Stormbreaker. spinoff yeah. about Stormbreaker <laughs> yes uh, on the topic of Mjolnir two things I really like we off screen uh, Lady Thor the mighty Thor like it was so, yeah, that's I great. thought it was so cool that they didn't have to go through like we got the idea and it was like eh, we don't even have to worry about showing it I like that uh, we'll reveal it in a much more interesting way which is when um you know, Thor finds out about it. Uh, right. And also, uh, th- uh, fucking Mjolnir breaking into a hundred pieces and killing enemies and coming back together. Yes. So cool. What the so fuck? So I did not, ex- I expected <laughs> gags and this movie over delivered <laughs> and was, was amazing on the gags. What I did not expect was like some cool sequences like that. Like I thought that was really awesome and it comes back and they, and they have such heft, like the, the pieces feel. So in terms of uh, effects, I feel like that stuff was actually really working for me uh, exceptionally well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really cool move being able to like shotgun all the broken pieces (laughs) of Mjolnir. It's, It's, it's very cool. The way it reassembles itself too is very visually interesting. The way Jane Foster utilizes that power at the very end of the movie to kind of capture all the broken elements of the Necro Sword and destroy them. Yeah, it's all very cool. <laughs> it is very cool, and I like it a lot. And I, I actually just wasn't expecting to get like the MCU level set pieces in this. Like, I that really was my lower expectation, and uh, I think it I think it delivered. Um, by probably another sequence we'll bring up. Uh, for another moment, I have to mention the moment that I laughed so hard. I think it's the funniest joke in the entire movie. You is kind of led where with no this. one else laughed. I'm is excited the, to hear what this is. This is the part where no one else laughed, but it's 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 a blink and you'll miss it because there's another joke happening. But it's when um we get uh, the distress call, right? We get the distress call for Thor and the Guardians, where it's like Thor uh, Gore, the God Butcher, is killing lots of gods. Which we get the sequence of he's killed multiple gods. That's that's our or the God Butcher moment of he's, mm-hmm. he's on this war page, which I know wasn't didn't say you wanted to see more gods stabbed in the face. I got you. You got a bloodlust, and that's okay. So uh, he realizes Golden that bloodlust. the only person left that Taika didn't kill in Ragnarok, um, what's her face? Sif? Yeah. Lady Sif? Literally, I call her what's her face. From that movie, I didn't much like. But Sif is on a snow planet, and he needs to go save her. So Thor leaves the Guardians, goes to save her, she is, she's she's had her arm cut off and she's dying and he goes we need to get you away from this place and she goes no i will die here on the field so i the battlefield so i can go to valhalla and he goes um well technically you survived the battle so if you die it won't count now your arm your arm's in valhalla your arm might be in valhalla, your arm might be in valhalla. <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a great game. Mickey and I great Mickey game. and I laughed at that as well <laughs> like, same <laughs> it's in that moment because it's like the you know it, it reminded me of like I will say that <laughs> moment functional. while I appreciate it and laughed at it and I think it's a funny joke also is a little tonally inconsistent considering Sif and Thor's relationship in the universe it should have been if she was injured to this degree and dying i feel like thor would have had a little more concern considering that like they're somewhat romantically involved prior to him dating jane foster no jokes but it's a great bit it works within the moment no jokes funnier than i care about all that uh it's good (laughs) she lives if she would have died if like she would have died i think that would have probably been way more irreverent but she yeah. lives and she's she doesn't have her arm and she's training the kids at the end. Uh, but that joke of your now your arm because because <laughs> it feels like it, Thor is being genuine, which is what Chris Hemsworth does so well, which is he feels like he's trying to be genuine, but he's kind of a he's kind of a dummy. 
Um, because Thor is a little dumb. I mean, he doesn't know a what bit of a doofus. Yeah, well, because and I don't think <laughs> yes. people criticize it for like, oh, Thor's just dumb. It's like Thor in the first Thor movie, he's like, what is this spork? <laughs> you know, whatever the <laughs> fuck he's doing. Um, he's always been kind of dumb, but like you think about it, he's like the ultimate rich kid who doesn't know what it's like to do this. Right. Thing. It feels very genuine sure. that he's like, well, you don't worry, your arm made it to the island. It's it's the perfect combination of Hemsworth humor. Uh, and Viking Norse mythology and the MCU that uh, really made me laugh way louder than anybody else in my theater at that joke. Uh, but I thought that was particularly good. Any other stand-up moments that we would call out? I I just want to touch on the advice that Star-Lord gives Thor at the beginning of the film. Uh, it's delivered in a very silly way, but I I do appreciate how that advice comes around full circle at the end of the movie, Star Lord saying like it's better to have loved love and lost. Basically, it's better to have love and lost mm -hmm. than never loved at all. Is essentially what he's saying in this very roundabout way. And how Star Lord loved Gamora. They had a relationship, and then Gamora died. And by the end of the movie, Thor has rekindled his love with Jane. And at the end of the movie, she passes on. So now Thor is basically in the exact same place that Star Lord is uh, at the beginning of this film. And and that's what he was kind of seeking. Uh, the whole movie, you know? So I do like that. Again, it's a little flimsy and a little silly, but I can see what Taika's trying to do from point A to point B with that. Yeah. Yep. I think it's, I think it's a very sweet moment. Uh, underscored by, um, you know, Thor is clearly not being welcomed by the Guardians. Never was. At the end of Infinity War, they're like, what are you doing? And that tone is consistently... I love character. that dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> Brian. Um, I thought the uh, Thor granting the power to all the kids and all the everyone just kicking ass, kind of basic, but uh, so fun and yeah, so much fun. So good. Yeah. Mickey turned to me in the theater and said, "I can't wait to see what that stuffed bunny does," and it does not disappoint. <laughs> it does not disappoint. No. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, they all pick yeah. up keyblades. By the way, is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, basically, <laughs> all basically, entirely. yeah. Donald Duck shows up. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was really fun. And then we brought it up earlier, but the black and white sequence oh. was, I was just kind of like, wow. It's great. There's How the mean, colors just really... sucked out of everything. It's a moment where they're walking around the planet too. It's so Taika and it's so yeah, cool. all The depth of it. So yeah, it's... It, it's clear standout but yeah. even the like so it's cool and i was automatically like oh yeah this is pretty dope uh we haven't seen anything like this mjolnir is adding color it's so cool um we actually get like a really tense scene where um D christian bale is egging on thor to call down stormbreaker and it's like it's like kind right. of the most like kind of like uh what's gonna happen moment um but that actual fight scene plays out so cool in like the low gravity fight and you get like Mighty Thor, uh, Jane Foster doing really cool stuff over while Valkyrie's, you know, battling. And um, like, I think it's visually just super interesting, like all around. Uh, I was Agreed. really engaged. And I still think even in the third act, like delivers even with that, like last fight sequence too. Um, despite that being a high point, I still think the, you know, I was like afraid. I was like, well, nothing else in this film is going to match this. And I don't think it truly does, but uh, still have cool stuff throughout that uh, was definitely definitely a high point uh which i didn't expect that the visuals work so well uh anything else that you uh gentlemen want to mention i think that's pretty much it we notice how we never even mentioned russell crowe we never mentioned anything no i i just don't want to uh, elongate it i think russell crowe's great i love the orgy gag throughout Yes. I love that all these gods don't give it, you know, that they're like... I think it's very representative of who Zeus actually is in mythology. He and, doesn't give a fuck about humans. And the humans. fact that the gods are literally not even talking about anything that is relevant to their... like, And that's the, a theme, a their followers, theme, yeah. right? Is that they, they actually don't care about any people. They're like literally like, how are we going to all fuck later? <laughs> like, Self-important. We have all, yeah. the, all this power, right? And then you get the gag with Chris Hemsworth getting naked. It's fun. It's good. <laughs> the loki tattoo on his back is excellent yeah there's a lot he actually has a natasha it's... romanov too um, oh i didn't even see the natasha there's like an r.i.p to all funny. the people that have died yeah yeah oh my gosh great stuff because he's, he's a true believer um did you like the zeus bolt are we glad that he got the zeus bolt i'm indifferent <laughs> i kind of like the zeus bolt i like how it splits in it half fun. and uh how it adds kind of some new visual elements it's it's it's, it's pretty fun 
It's cool how it lights that black and white scene when they're on the asteroid that mm-hmm. we were just talking about. But oh, yeah. overall, either way. <laughs> I like how it goes through Russell Crowe's Crow's stomach. I was pretty surprised by that. It makes sense that he he survives, but I was just like, oh, wow. Yeah. In in terms of what you were saying about God butchering, um, that was... uh, Okay. So, look, I would love for us to receive some emails about this. I tweeted this out on on my personal Twitter, but... uh, in regards to how much we get Gore the God Butcher and how much we actually see him butcher gods, we I think we literally only see him kill the god at the beginning of the movie, right? And yet, no, you when a mon- and this is kind of my big kind on of like- screen, you see him kill a god once. No, I know, like but you- it is known to the viewer that he's yeah, going around it. killing gods, and there's a yeah. scene of, of everybody's multiple- talking about it. <laughs> Everybody in the movie's talking about it. You want, but we never see it Christian other than Bale that first just scene. like cutting off the heads of people. Just one more. He kills, you know, like he kills two because he kills the god in the very beginning, and then he kills mm-hmm. the ice god that he literally comes down to when um, Sif is there. That one god, he's like, oh, he's a very funny god or whatever. We don't see that. That's off screen. No, but he's dead on screen. We know he. We see that he's been butchered. Yeah, we see many gods after the fact dead. On How screen, many times do we, we see never... the shark in Jaws kill somebody in Jaws? Like several times. <laughs> Like the no no, but the actual shark, not implied. We see the shark bite somebody and kill them on screen. Several times. We not we don't actually see the shark, but we see the mm, death scene. How do we know it's him though? Brian, back me up on this. I don't <laughs> think those things are equivalent. I think you're both you're both kind of right here. I don't think it's the best comparison necessarily, but I do think, yeah, you I don't think often you do we see could the have death seen actually happen. Yes. Rather than I think the we could have seen him kill a god at least one more time. Need a god after that. first picking up the necro sword, like physically stabbing somebody that's not one of our main characters. But, but we don't feel particularly bad when Thor realizes that these gods are a bunch of assholes and just kind of starts. No, <laughs> like, no, definitely. No, we're kind that. of with uh, with Gore, right? Which I think might be the danger. Moment, right? Which is like we might get a little too behind him. I'm like, you know mm-hmm. what? I think you're right, bro. Fucking kill them all. This I think this is also the villain, though, right? It's like yeah. his, his story is like this kind of universal question. It's like the Job thing, right? It's like, what if Job just fully turned on God? Yeah. <laughs> like, a gab. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's Thor. Not touching that one. Listen, we're running long. We'll, 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 we'll have a we'll have an MCU we'll look at the phases chris i promise we'll do it we'll do it but we've gone on too long that's fine yeah i think it's fine any final thoughts on thor 11 thunder brian just like the moon uh thor has four phases and you know uh people aren't gonna love all of them but he's gonna have a fifth (laughs) well yeah no yeah thor will return thor will return i did appreciate that kind of call back to the earliest phases as as well um but yeah i i really had a really fun time with this movie i was appreciative somehow i thought the screening would have been totally sold out but i had an empty seat next to me and i was like you know what there i you appreciate go. that um but yeah I, I had a great time with this uh but i can definitely understand the the concerns with people with tone here but it was very much up my alley and I was uh, laughing throughout the whole, the whole thing. Brian, your arm most certainly in Valhalla. Chris, <laughs> any final thoughts? Are you excited to rewatch it? I am excited to rewatch it. Like, like I said, and it's the same sentiment I had with Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness. These films are so visually interesting. That's going to be the true draw when sure. it comes to the rewatch. Like this is something that I'll definitely be able to rewatch multiple times solely because of the visuals, regardless of how I feel about the narrative. Thor love and thunder, not the best MCU movie, not the worst Thor movie. That's kind of where I sit Agreed. with this movie. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely have this in the upper half of my MCU movies, just for it's uh, it's definitely and it's it's number one MCU comedy, for sure, hands down. Uh, nearly, I remember watching it and I was like, this is nearly Spaceballs level parody of an MCU movie, and I'm so happy this exists. And it's overall not super consequential to the rest of the MCU. 
and I don't think a ton of the films we've gotten in phase six are, which is totally fine for phase four, phase seven of the uh, DCU, uh, the dark universe side of it. Uh, I think that it's, it's, it's a fine place to be. Uh, I do just, I know we're not talking about the phases, but God damn it. Are we talking about the fucking phases? I just, I do appreciate that, you know, we're getting big swings sure. in, in, in this, these phases. I think this is one of them. I think multiverse of madness, even eternals, you know, yeah, I, I think in this phase, well, but they're really kind of like going for things in this phase. I agree with you. We've gotten the biggest swings, eternals, multiverse of madness and Thor love and thunder. They are the, the most, the MCU has ever allowed directors to put their stamp on something. Um, and I can see why not everybody likes that. I'm included in some of those things, but not all of them. Um, Christian doesn't want to go further into this topic, so I won't. Hey, we'll have more thoughts as the MCU continues. We get uh, Wakanda forever at the end of this year. So we will. I think that's. We'll see how that is. <laughs> yeah. Don't have high hopes, eh? Okay. Okay. That, that movie has a lot going against it. It does, meaning uh, mainly uh, that uh, Black Panther uh, is not a character anymore because of the tragic uh, things that have uh, gone on the last couple of years. So that's that's um, that sucks. Um, it is it is going to be tough, but I believe in them. I believe they can pull it out. Same director, right? Coogler is coming back. Ryan Coogler, yeah. Hey, that's that is a that is a sign in the right direction. If he would have left the project. Mm. The fact that he's still with it, I think, should give us all confidence that we will get something cool. Um, I'm excited to see what they do. Definitely not a hand that I would like to be dealt. All right, gentlemen, where can people find more of your work on the internet? Loyal viewers and listeners, you can find me on Twitter at Chris Conkling, talking about all things nerdy, television, movies, comic books, video games, collectibles. If it's nerdy, I'm talking about it. And then you can find my nerdy ramblings on careful, carefulforspoilers.com monthly and you can find me over on twitter at true popoholic you can find my band at midnight satire augmented reality ep streaming now i make music find it there midnight satire and also uh we have music video not so serious man streaming on youtube and uh, all those places so look for that on not so serious man also uh you play on a uh, uh, serious man which is a play on book a job which we mentioned earlier boom so fun circular all connected tying it back uh bore the god butch anyway you can also bore the butch god or the buff <laughs> thorgy yeah the th- orgy bit i'm here for it i'm, yeah, I'm christian here. pale so many great it's puns great. Great. <laughs> jane mm, foster the people huh.